You know, so just before we get started, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Marcelo. I'm from kind of right outside of the Dallas area in Texas. Um, I work for a company called Slalom Consulting, and we're a big kind of app dev, web design shop that just works with some really cool companies in Dallas. Um, and I, I work in our user experience practice, but kind of focused on UI implementation. So the team that's actually working closely with app dev to write the code that, that builds the interfaces for the stuff that we build. So let me ask a question for you guys here in the room. Who in here works at a company or is working on a project where you guys have a pattern library today? Cool. Um, wait, wait, keep your hands up. How many of you guys have a pattern library that's in sync with the real application that it's powering? All right, well, the, the first time I gave this, this talk, I saw more hands go down. Um, but this is really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, all of you guys probably heard the term that uh, Gina talked about in her keynote yesterday, zombie pattern libraries. Um, for us, when we look at that, um, what that really means is that your pattern library is alive because, hey, you've got some cool code snippets. It's not a PDF style guide. Um, but the reality is that it doesn't, well, it doesn't really reflect the reality of your application. Um, no one uses it, maybe it's kind of died off, so it's kind of the walking dead, right? We've got zombies here. Um, if anybody here is a fan of um, the walking dead, there was a great quote at the beginning of the season that asks, how do you keep living knowing that's, how, that's what the world is like? You know, asking in terms of surviving a zombie apocalypse. Well, since what we're doing in our jobs isn't life or death, I'm going to amend that quote and say, how do you keep building interfaces knowing that's what the world is like? Because if there's one thing I've taken away from the last two days here, it's like, man, this is a really hard problem to solve, and we have some of the best minds doing this. Um, and we haven't cracked that nut yet. Um, you know, we're all experimenting and trying different things. And um, we felt that same way when it came to pattern libraries, right? We saw developers who, who really liked having a pattern library on the project that they were working on. Um, we saw it really benefiting the design process, but we were kind of in this unique situation that as a consulting firm, we couldn't just build it once, go super deep, make it really awesome, and be done for the day, right? For us, we have multiple projects spinning up, new projects starting up every month, different skill sets on every project, and that was kind of how we approached this problem, right? We looked at it and we said, how do we keep building interfaces and try to fix the world, right? How do we start to change this culture so that not only while we're working on the project and building a pattern library, when we hand them off to our clients at the end of the day and they're gonna be the ones that are gonna run with it, how do we make sure they as a company continue to be able to, to survive and keep these pattern libraries alive? So what's interesting is um, we really started off rethinking the design process itself. Um, a major theme that I'm going to be talking about in this talk is that this is not a technology problem. This is a people and process problem. And a lot of people that I've talked to here over the last couple days um, maybe are on more of the development side and they're like, hey, my designers don't think like this. They keep like pulling out the rug from under me or we made all these decisions on Friday and we walk in on Monday and the designers rethought it all over the weekend. Right, so for us, building a successful pattern library means starting to rethink the design process and a quote that was out there, um, it was several years ago, came from Andy Clark, but this really resonates with this whole theme of how we should build interfaces. It's that we should build systems and not pages. I was brought up in the design world where you did all these beautiful Photoshop comps, you know, presented them to the client, you know, you did the whole Don Draper reveal and the client's blown away, and then you toss them over to the developers and they go and work. But there is value in that process, um, for us, we look at that as a creative process in terms of designing a new interface or trying to set the direction for a project. But then the designer has to go a step further and really extract the important bits from that um, interface. By doing this, um, there was an email that I got one time from a developer on a project that came on and we had a pattern library. And he says on there, I'm crying over here loving it. This coupled with the user stories makes the process much easier. It's less painful, it's more productive, I'm a lot happier at the end of the day. Um, and for a lot of people here that maybe are struggling with, hey, how do, I, how do I even get my company to let me do this? Or how do I sell this to my client? For us, we look at pattern libraries as something that accelerates the design process and the development process. So jumping off from there, um, both Dave Rupert, who I think will be speaking at four o'clock, and Mark Otto, who created Bootstrap, talked about building a tiny bootstrap. Um, I think Gina might have talked about that in her keynote yesterday as well. And it's basically this idea of like, Maybe you're using Bootstrap, maybe you're not, but for every client, the deliverable that you're handing off is a design system. 
So here's what that process looks like for us. Um, we start off doing your typical Photoshop comps, right? We've got half the people in our UX practice are pure visual designers, don't write any code. They're working in Photoshop, Sketch, Axure, any, any tool like that. So they go out and they do these design comps. But then they actually slice those and turn them into the useful bits, right, that we're gonna use to then reassemble our pages into, a re, into reusable components. So here's an example of what that looks like. These were three comps that we built for a, it was a huge web application for a prison telecommunications company. And um, what, what we, the first step that we did after the client kind of approved these designs is start to pull out those useful bits. So you can see that there's two timelines on there that are very similar, right? Those start to look like components. You can see table styles that kind of get repeated in different contexts. Um, you know, so we've got like on the bottom right here we have a, a results page, but then on the left we have like a dashboard widget. They, it's, it's the exact same style that's just being used in a different context. Same thing with uh, dashboard widgets, if you can tell what these are. It's basically just like a box where the content changes inside, but we're focusing on pulling out those important parts. And so what's great about this is we're rethinking the design process. Um, so many of the design tools out there today, both Sketch and Photoshop, are starting to support this design process better. Um, there was somebody else, and I couldn't see who they were when we were talking about the speaker panel, that like Creative Cloud is really pushing the bounds. So I want to take a look at what they're doing. And if you guys are developers and you're not actually using those tools, go back and tell your designers about these. They may have no idea that it's in there. Most Photoshop junkies that I talk to just do what they've always known. They've never explored some of the new features that Adobe is pushing out. So Sketch, um, which is really kind of everybody's darling these days, it writes all wrongs of Photoshop and everything. Um, they have this idea of symbols inside of it. And so symbols are basically you, you extract those reusable bits and you can kind of stamp them across. If I'm doing a button, I can even replace the text, but then I can go update it once. If I update it once, it kind of propagates through all my designs. Right, so you can imagine a shared design system for just a group of designers who are reusing those symbols. Photoshop has actually gone a step further. So I really love what they're doing with their Creative Cloud libraries. Um, if, you're, if you're a Photoshop user, you can actually go to the window menu and click this Libraries button, and you get this nice little tool pane over here that, that pops up that lets you pull in color palettes, character styles, and then graphics, um, where the graphics are a single or multiple layers into a single panel here, and then I can just drag and drop those into different Photoshop files. I believe with the last release that Photoshop did, um, you're actually able to collaborate on these with teams as well. So you can have multiple people contributing into the library, and as they make those updates, those changes will propagate. And again, if you're working in a design process where you've got kind of Photoshop being handed off to developers, Photoshop even lets you generate these websites using Creative Cloud that takes that content, and you can send your developer to this page and say, hey, here are my patterns. You know, go, go build these as patterns in, in our pattern library. So this is great. Um, but at that same time, you still have that design process where you've kind of got people working in Photoshop over here, you've got developers working in code over here, and that's really where we see the design process breaking down. Tools don't fix the problem. You can be using Photoshop libraries or Sketch or whatever it might be, but the, the, it's the process that you have to focus on changing. I don't know about where you guys come from, but where I come from, a lot of design processes look like this. You've got designers working on one side, kind of doing discovery and design and kind of working through those changes. And then you've got a silo and then developers working on the other side where they're just developing and testing those features, right? And you kind of get this, this toss over, over the wall or silo. And that traditional handoff is broken, right? And that's what we're looking to fix with pattern libraries. Um, we need to kind of unify all of those into a single cycle where we're doing discovery, design, developing, development, and testing. And what's great is pattern libraries are the central hub to do that, to kind of unify that design and development process. I, I've even um, referred to the pattern library as the Rosetta Stone between design and development because it translates what design intended into something that developers can use. So here's what that looks like. You remember that design process that we were talking about. Of course, the pattern library becomes that, that middle bit um, that really documents what those sliced up pieces from your designs are. So here's what that looks like on a typical project for us. Um, once we have a mature design system and it's kind of well documented and developers are comfortable using that, designing looks more like this, right? I probably wouldn't, well, 
the guy who did these sketches, I wish I sketched this awesome, but this guy would maybe post these sketches to Dribble, but I would say I would not post most of my sketches to Dribble, right? And all of a sudden as a designer, I need to get out of my own, um, my desire to be recognized and realize that a lot of the work that I'm doing at this point is not focused on the types of things that I can post to Dribble and really advertise in the community. Instead, I'm just doing sketches that can illustrate something. And so from that sketch, we can, we can line up the page that this was representing. Um, and here, what, the way that, that we've worked, we've even gone so far as building a, a prototyping framework that makes it super easy for designers to just write some HTML and CSS and build an application um, or build a prototype of that application. And so as a, as a designer, I can go build this prototype or I can hand that sketch off to a developer and basically say, hey, look at these side by side, right? I can put visitor approval over here and I know what that component, that reusable component looks like. I can put a details panel on my sketch and basically just tell the developer, hey, go use the details panel or you know, whatever it is, the details component. And so they just know that they can drop that in. What that does is it eliminates waste in the design process. Right? If you think about it, wireframes, comps, all this uh, documentation that designers put together, red lines, it's all waste. It's all in support of building the application, but it's throwaway at the end of the day. And so we're able to skip kind of the Axure, Balsamic, low fidelity wireframe part. We can skip high fidelity Photoshop comps. And really what happens is the role of the designer starts to evolve, hopefully into something that they enjoy doing, right? Um, what, what the pattern library really enables a designer to do is get away from tweaking Photoshop comps on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock for developers and instead focus on solving real user experience problems. User flows, talking to users, doing testing, coming up, generating new ideas. If you're in a consulting mindset, um, we've even, we do a lot more group facilitation and we look for those types of skills where we're bringing stakeholders together and kind of running design studios and having them generate new ideas for us to test. Right, all of a sudden, I'm not sitting in Photoshop all day. My role is really, really becomes problem solver. So as you walk into that, um, a question to ask yourself is where does your pattern library live in the design process, right? We're talking about process. And we've put together a maturity model that is kind of what we've seen at different companies um, and just different ways that people inject a pattern library or maybe are doing design. So the lowest level that we see is kind of just inconsistent. Um, I'm talking to a client right now that has 40 applications that were built over 10 years, and it was literally like they built the first application, they copy and pasted the CSS into a new project, started building the second application. And so if you look at like two applications that were built kind of at a near time, they look the same, but from like application one to application 40, they're completely different because that design system evolved, and they didn't go back to their old like web forms project to go update the CSS in there. It just wasn't worth it. From there, um, this is actually probably the most common. A lot of companies will go hire an ad agency and do just kind of like a one-time style guide. Usually this is like a branding document or something like that. Kind of send you some fonts, some colors, you know, maybe I've even seen some of these, they'll put out some like homepage concepts or marketing pages just to, to illustrate that brand. But it's basically dead on arrival, right? How many developers here have worked on something like that and you're like handed the style guide and it's like, well, this totally does, yeah, I see some hands going up. Um, it, this just totally doesn't reflect the reality of what we're building or it doesn't give me anything useful. So from there, you can have kind of a manual pattern library. This is what, where I think a lot of the people that I've talked to this weekend and this week are, where they're kind of, they, they go try to build that pattern library. It's a very manual process and it very quickly gets out of sync. Um, I was listening to an interview with MailChimp who did a big redesign and they had an old pattern library and they kind of went and redesigned the whole application but then once they launched it, they had to take a step back and then go back and re-document everything that was in their design. So where we really try to take our clients is an automated pattern library where it's actually part of your build and it shares code with the application. And from there, what we say, that's kind of the minimum ideal state that we talk about. And from there, you can kind of go a level higher and maybe even spin up a dedicated team that maintains that library, right? Kind of like Gina talked about with Salesforce. But we always like to make it clear to clients, you don't always necessarily have to have a full-blown team where, we, where you're hiring designers and developers. You know, we, we work with 50, 100-person companies where that's just not realistic. There was a great quote um, from Phil Hawksworth that I saw recently. Unless it's a part of your build, your style guide is just more documentation to maintain, right? And that's why we're kind of looking to get up into that automated workflow. And really, the best term that I've heard for that 
it's the holy grail, right? The holy grail is I can keep all my styles synced in the same place and just share that code out to multiple applications. So who doesn't want to go find the holy grail? I mean, come on. Um, so here's the thing. What I want to talk about is how do you get started today? Um, if, if you don't have a pattern library, if your pattern library is dead, um, how do you go back and kind of get this up and running? Because the reality is most of the projects that I walk onto, we're not doing this like greenfield design that we have this perfect, you know, we can think in components the whole time and build these Photoshop libraries. Most of the time I'm walking onto a project that already has an established UI and we're trying to extract all those useful bits and come up with something to document. So the first step in doing that, we always start with taking an inventory. Um, take an inventory of both the application ecosystem, right? Sometimes we work with a lot of clients that it's much more than just one application. We, look at, we have to look at a meaningful set of applications to really extract all the useful pieces. Um, but then also taking an inventory of all the patterns that currently exist. So the way that we do that, we'll go through and just build like a keynote or PowerPoint document or Google Docs, whatever it is, with just screenshots of different components that we find. We've even done this um, just totally manually where we print out a whole bunch of pages and just get in a room, paste them up on the wall, and bring a whole bunch of people together and facilitate that conversation between maybe some internal designers, some product owners, right? And it's amazing what you can do when you start to facilitate those discussions. So, but we always try to end up in this state where we're kind of building this component inventory. And so here's what a page from there looks like. In this particular app, we kind of had a desktop and mobile version. So we'd kind of document, here's the desktop version, here's the mobile version. We'd even take an inventory of where, where did we find these components, which can come in, come in handy in just a little bit. And then it's also important to give it kind of a meaningful name at this point that we can start to refer to it by. And here's really what you're looking for um, early on in this kind of component inventory uh, process. You're looking for base styles. What are the colors that are used? What are the fonts? What are, what's the grid system that they're using, if they're even using one? Icons, spacing units, right? We need consistent global spacing units to make this easier for developers um, so that it's not like, you know, 21 pixels here and 23 pixels over there. Um, so kind of looking at the base styles, looking for components. This is kind of what you just saw on that screenshot. And then finally, this is one that's really easy to overlook, but really thinking about page templates and how do all those components slot together in a meaningful way, right? What does a search results page look, look like? What does a detail page look like? Um, a lot of times when a, when a team comes in and starts thinking about just the components, they can extract that. And then the second developers go to actually implement something, they're like, well, how do I actually put these together, right? What's the bigger picture? If you ascribe to atomic design, that's kind of looking at the pages and templates portion. Um, so from there, a lot of times if we're walking onto an existing project, we need to focus on standardizing what we've found. Um, I talked about spacing units. This was actually a, a whiteboard sketch that we did. Um, I happen to be the front end developer on the project. I was pairing up with the designer and this probably looks like nothing. Um, but really what I wanna point out, what we did is we kind of sketched out what the kind of wireframe of that interface looked like. And then we met with the designer and we were like, hey, let's standardize this, right? So it's 30 pixels of spacing above and below these form fields. We're gonna have 40% space around these units. We're gonna have two columns on each side, right? On this particular project, the designers had used um, a grid system, but then the developers had been really inconsistent in applying it. Um, we also gave kind of each component on the page, like core page header, core page content, et cetera. We kind of started to give it those meaningful names. So this was, again, you can see, I'm talking about people and processes. It was fostering that discussion between the designers and the developers. From there, we can go into documentation. I'm gonna use Salesforce real quick because they have some of the best documentation that I've seen, but this is just an example of um, some, some really well done documentation. And here, they'll give it a name. They'll give you a description of how to use it. I wanna pause here on this one. Um, Something that I was hearing about, uh, if any of you guys went to the talk on fostering an open source culture, they were, uh, Kevin was talking about writing, writing as an organization. And to me, this documentation piece is the easiest one to overlook. It can be like, hey, this is a button, use the button style or whatever, you know, something super simple. But this is a place that as your design system evolves, you can document the thinking behind what's going on. So if you think about it, if you have a design system, somebody could come in here and add a modifier for example, like, hey, I need it for this specific state, so they go create the modifier. And when they submit a pull request, you end up with some CSS changes that maybe introduces a new modifier or a new sub-element or something, but then you also can see the thinking behind it and what they intended to do, right? There is so much value 
in writing through what you're doing before you go commit the code. Um, it just forces you to think. And anybody who's ever gone to write out an issue on Stack Overflow or file an issue on a GitHub repo, half the time I go do that, I start writing it out and figure out the solution myself before I've um, actually submitted the question. So anyways, from there, when you're documenting, um, you definitely want to do like a live code example. You want to do, um, a, and, and then you want to do a code snippet that developers can copy and paste. I'm going to pause here real quick because um, in our situation, again, we're doing a lot of different projects. We also happen to be a consulting firm that has multiple tech stacks. I mean, we've got like Java Scala backends, we've got .NET backends. Sometimes, you know, it's just that, and we're just using whatever the templating engine is. We've got Angular, React, Angular 1, Angular 2. So we really focus on kind of just reusable HTML. But you can repurpose this for whatever you need. So um, if you are on a project, for example, that you know is just going to be a React project, use this space to document out maybe what the, uh, the return value could be or maybe what the entire React component needs to be. Right? You can get really creative with your documentation in here. Um, and if anybody came to Jonathan Snook's talk earlier about CSS architecture, I think he was the one that made the point that Bootstrap got really popular um, because of great documentation. So anyways, going from there, um, Salesforce went so far as including accessibility, um, variants about, um, for, for different components. But again, don't feel like your first pass at your pattern library has to be this robust. I'm guessing, I mean, I, I don't know, Gina, did you guys spend a long time building this stuff? How long? Eight months. Eight months. Okay, so if you're gonna go back and try to sell someone on an eight month project for your company, it's probably not gonna work. So what we look at is just basic documentation. So really just capture the name, the description, an example, and a code snippet, right? If you just capture that, you're already gonna be heads and shoulders above what you had before. Um, I'm gonna throw in a 3A here um, before we move on, but this is also a great time to centralize your CSS. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, and the tools that we've built to be able to do that, but if there's some way at this point for you to take the CSS and kind of put it in one place, everything we do from here on is, is gonna be easier because you can make the change once and have it propagate out to different applications. But again, we'll talk about some ideas on how to do that in a bit. So from there, steps three and four. Um, usually, uh, I don't know about you guys, but any CSS code base that I walk into is probably bad CSS. Because, come on, what's good CSS? Um, but what we really like to do is define the CSS standards. You know, where do we want to go? Do we want to use BEM? Do we want to use SMACS? How do we want to organize it, right? Whatever is meaningful for that project. And then just take time as you go to refactor to get there. So here's kind of the approach that we take to do that. Um, first, what we try to do is build reusable components, right? Just focus on kind of good CSS practices in terms of just keeping those concerns separate in terms of a, a, C, a single component. So in this case, this project, we have components, and we've got like the, the buttons, the features, the footer, and a hero. Um, when we refactor those, then we can focus on namespacing the CSS. Again, use whatever practice you want here, Smacks, BEM, whatever it is. In this case, though, the point that I'm wanting to make is you can start to refactor these components and rebuild them in your pattern library. Right, so if I, if I identified this accordion that's out there that's maybe implemented in three or four different ways, we've gone and we've standardized that component, then I can go rebuild it with good CSS from the ground up and kind of give that, um, and just use a unique namespace that makes sure that everything is gonna live within that component. Right, so then, from then on out, we kind of have this new pretty component that then we can focus on refactoring as we go. So maybe a story in, a, in, in the, this two week sprint is gonna be, hey, go rip out all the accordions and let's implement the new one, right? So you get this small unit of change and then you can kill all that dead code. Um, from there, I always like to point out find in project is your friend as you're refactoring. Um, you know, obviously you wanna find like what classes are used, how are they used. Um, one little tidbit, uh, and I'll have the slides up there later so don't feel like you have to capture this. This regular expression search, and you can use it in Sublime Text, Atom, anything else, will look for any instance, so you can see at the end I have table. Um, this is gonna look for any instance where class equals, and then inside of the quotes, you have table. Um, again, that can be useful because if I'm refactoring or I'm trying to look for what the class table uses, there's gonna be the HTML element table. There might be table all over my JavaScript. It might be all over the place. So this just helps you find specific instances of those classes. Um, and I always like to point out, and mainly this is a reminder for myself so I don't forget, but don't forget about JavaScript, right? If you're walking onto like a jQuery project, 
Um, it's really easy to be like, hey, you know, found, found this CSS. It's not used anywhere in the HTML. Delete. And then you find out that that class gets triggered by jQuery or something like that. You know, and it just didn't exist in your HTML. So never forget about JavaScript when you're refactoring your CSS. So that's kind of the technical part of building out the pattern library. Um, but from there, really focus on governing the library. You know, this is really the meat of what I was saying, that this is a people and process problem. This is not a technology problem, right? Doing steps one through four that I just talked about, that's pretty easy. On most, you know, small to medium-sized projects, that can be done in a couple of weeks if somebody can go head da heads down. But really looking at what does that process look like going forward. So the first thing that we really try to do is if we're extracting the CSS, kind of putting it in a different place, um, is really focusing on CSS code reviews. There was a great talk yesterday um, about CSS code reviews, and so she actually had a whole bunch of points to look for in your CSS. Um, honestly, I would just send you to those slides whenever those get sent out, because it was this amazing list of like stuff that we need to look for. Um, but if most of you guys, I would guess, um, all of you really care about CSS, obviously you're here, but when you go back home, I bet most of your projects are like, hey, we submitted a pull request, the developers tore up each other's code, you know, the JavaScript, all the Ruby or whatever else, and then it was like, oh, and the CSS, yeah, I, whatever. You know, I don't care what was going in there. I think uh, Jonathan made that point earlier today, if anybody was in his talk, and that totally resonated with me, because that's how, what I see on most projects. So if you can really focus on doing those CSS code reviews, that's gonna push you to keep that CSS um, scalable over time. Um, I'm not gonna spend very long on this, because Gina talked about it yesterday, but the team models for scaling a design system um, basically, you know, this was a Nathan Curtis article. He was talking about three different models. He had the solitary model, where this is kind of the bootstrap version, where, you know, hey, we built this, you guys can go use it. That, that might be how you guys approach this when you get back to work. Um, there can be the centralized model, where it's like, hey, we're gonna have a team, and they're gonna maintain this pattern library. And I'll just point out here that this is what a lot of clients, when we first sit down with them, they think, yeah, that's what we can do. They get really into the pattern library. They're pretty pumped about it. Maybe they read some articles about it. And they're like, cool, we're gonna go hire three developers and they're gonna maintain this pattern library. And that's where we have to clarify, you know, this isn't always the best model by itself because you run the risk, and this is what I've seen with developers that have been put on this, they, they're, their deliverable is just building some documentation and they lose the context of the products they're building this for, right? They're really bad at going out to those product teams and thinking about the problems they're having. So that's where Gina talked about the federated model as well. Um, this is basically where you have product designers from the outside coming together to, um, to really share this. Um, so I won't, I won't talk too much more about that because you talked about it, but looking, um, again, there was a great talk right before lunch today or right before the, the speaker panel about building an open source culture. Um, I'm gonna throw out, uh, so Kevin is actually speaking right now. I wished he was speaking at three o'clock so I could send you guys to his talk after this. But he, re he had some amazing slides about fostering an open source culture at your company. And so when you think about it, that's not like using open source at your company, but it's looking at how do open source projects behave and how can we incorporate that into our company. So he, was ta uh, you know, he just had some amazing points. This link down here is gonna be his slides, his blog post, I don't know. He told me to put that link there, so I'm guessing if you go there, you can get all of his resources. But again, literally, that was an hour long talk <coughs> that is just focused on this process that I learned this weekend. You know, that's, you know, I'm making slide updates right before this. And, and I would say I'm almost gonna take what he did and start repackaging that content for our clients in terms of how to keep that culture going forward of our pattern libraries. Um, so again, anybody who's been involved in open source, you understand that mindset of like, hey, we have kind of like a core team, but other people can come and contribute. So, um, We've kind of got a great process now. We've got some governance policies in place. We've even built out our first pattern library. Um, so when we did that, again, uh, this whole project came out of myself on kind of our design UX side and one of our principal app devs, his name is John Gulley and he couldn't be here. Um, we kind of came together and instead of saying, let's build a new tool to solve this problem, we were asking ourselves, what's the process that we want to take? And then let's find a tool or build a tool that's going to help us solve that. So our first, um, as we looked at the tools, we kind of grouped them into just single, um, single buckets. Again, a few people, I've heard a few talks calling out styleguides.io. They have a great list of resources and I can't list all of those. But I think there's a few buckets that most of the tools fall into. And each one kind of has its pros and cons. The first one being just writing CSS documentation. 
Um, what this looks like, there's a tool called KSS. Um, I can go into my SAS files or my CSS files um, and just start writing some comment blocks at the top and then it'll auto-generate some documentation for that. That's great in terms of like ease to stand this up, right? If you're walking into a blank CSS code base and you just need to like get something in there to start explaining what's going on, this is great because I can document it as I'm writing that code. Now the issue here is that this again becomes more focused on documentation and it doesn't solve the problem of debe developers just going in and like slamming in a change that uh, breaks everything. Um, and it doesn't encourage the team to necessarily write better CSS. Um, the next step on these is kind of just building a static site, right? Building, building the documentation. Uh, definitely, probably the most popular tool out there is Pattern Lab. This came from Brad Frost. And again, this one's really focused on just generating um, your atoms, your molecules, et cetera, and documenting them, really designing them in your system. He's got some awesome tools in there for like viewport break width, uh, breakpoints and everything. Um, now the issue with this is it's still separated from your implementation. And I say that with an asterisk because I've actually talked to a couple people here who have rigged up Pattern Lab to basically copy all their CSS code over to their main project and it's this whole like MacGyver-like uh, paper clips and, and everything else. Um, from what I've seen, Pattern Lab is great if you're mostly a designer and handing this off to a development team and then walking away. But if you're really focused on kind of that ongoing maintenance, you need something that's more integrated. So that's kind of the next step. Um, there are a few tools out there, something like Source.js, where it actually goes into your application and extracts the useful bits um, and kind of writes, auto-generates some documentation. Um, and it, it seems to work pretty well, but it's pretty complex. Um, documentation, you know, is kind of hard to read. And it only documents a single application, right? You integrate this with one app. So the majority of situations that I've found myself walking into are companies that have more than one application. So for us, and what we've talked about, is that we asked ourselves there has to be a better way. Um, none of these seem to satisfy what we needed. You know, again, some of these tools work great for specific situations, um, but given that we needed to go on projects and be able to spin these up rapidly, promote some good CSS practices and other things, we went, um, like I said, we envisioned kind of our dream process. We went out and, uh, and we did build our own tool for, for doing this. Um, it's called Pattern Pack. Um, it's an open source tool that's out there, and it kind of does three things really well. Um, it allows you to design and build your interface using tools that you're probably familiar with, HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, if you want to use it. Um, it allows you to document your pattern library, so it'll generate a static site for you. Um, and then finally, and this is really where it shines, it makes it really easy to share the code to one or more applications. Right? The, I would say the first two are probably the easy problem, it's the last one that gets really complicated, and we give you a set of tools that just fully automate that process of sharing code. So the way that Pattern Pack works, um, you know, we kind of take those designs that we've extracted from our component library, maybe they were done in Photoshop and Sketch. Um, we actually document those into Pattern Pack. Pattern Pack will automatically generate the static site, and then from there, you can share out the code to mobile apps, desktop apps, whatever it might be, um, but it'll publish an NPM or Bower module that allows other applications to pull that in. And it'll, it'll version it for you so that one application can be pointing at you know, 1.0.5, but then the design team's already on like version 2.6, right? So you can kind of keep that version process using NPM or Bower. And other applications consume your pattern library as a dependency, right? So it's the same thing as like NPM install bootstrap. So here's kind of how Pattern Pack works. Um, I'm, I'm scared to death of live demos, so I'm just gonna pretend on here. Um, and I should say, to get started, um, there is an example library that you can just go on GitHub, you know, pull it down and run Grunt, and it just starts it up. But um, again, the idea here is that we're extract, like I said, that 3A bullet, we're extracting the, H, the CSS out of our app. So we're actually gonna spin up a new project at this point. Um, it has two requirements, NPM and Git. And again, if your particular application doesn't use NPM, doesn't use Git, that's okay for now, because this is a brand new project that we're spinning up. Um, we've, we've integrated this with projects that use Subversion, with projects that use uh, TFS, uh, Microsoft's tool. Um, so you don't have to use Git if you don't need to, but Git is awesome, so definitely use it. From there, you just install um, a couple dependencies. You would do NPM install grunt and pattern pack. 
um, which are just the, they're the only two dependencies that you need to get started. And then you'd spin up a new grunt file um, with just a little bit of code. Um, the pattern pack task by default just has a few different tasks like run, build, and release. Um, but we do have like a ton of customization options that I won't even bother getting into in here because it's just, there's too much out there. So from there, um, once we've set up our grunt file, it's as simple as going grunt pattern pack run. And then we spin up and we basically have a blank pattern library on here. Um, it's, it gives you kind of this unstyled theme because you can actually go out and theme it yourself. But again, we're not giving you a UI framework. This isn't like a replacement for Bootstrap. This is for you to build your own Bootstrap. So we don't give you any of that. So from there, to build your own patterns, um, we can just start there, right? So we're gonna add a pattern. A pattern's made up of a few different things. Um, it's made up of a markdown file and an SCSS file, or less, or you can use your own processor, preprocessor if you need it, or just straight CSS. Um, but in this case, we'll use SAS. Um, so in those two files, again, we've got our SAS file where we can drop in all our styles. Um, part of our thinking and the, the design principles of Pattern Pack are to encourage better CSS principles. So in this case, um, you know, by splitting up our CSS fi or our SAS files into different components, um, we can try to encapsulate all the logic. Again, I know that sounds really simple and maybe we're doing it, but um, when you have de new developers walking onto a project like this, this is just trying to push them to, to do those CSS best practices. You know, we're adding just enough friction in the process that makes them try to think about things like this. And then in our markdown file, um, you know, again, the second piece of our documentation, there's, you can really put anything in here, but these are, ki this is kind of the template that we use. We'll use, we'll put in the documentation, you know, which again, you can put anything you want inside of that documentation. We'll do a live example, you know, so this is just straight HTML that's just wrapped by a div. And then we'll put just a code snippet underneath that's just inside of a markdown code block. And so inside of that file, you'll hit save, and then your browser will auto refresh, and it'll generate that documentation for you out of the box. So it's got live reload built in, it'll just run in the background and it'll watch everything. So that's great. Um, again, that's the part that's probably the easier portion of building a pattern library. So like I said, where Pattern Pack really shines and what, uh, what I was impressed by the first time I saw the prototype that John put together of this is really unleashing your creation. Um, from there, you, you really wanna look at semantic versioning for your design system. If you're not familiar with semantic versioning, it's the idea that you have major, minor, and patch releases. Um, by default, um, kind of if you go read the semantic versioning, there's a website out there, semverver.org. Um, if you go read it, kind of the way that they say it is a patch release. The idea is that these are kind of like bug fixes, just small changes. A minor release might have a few like break, small breaking changes, maybe it would require some code updates. But then major releases are like, hey, this is a totally new thing, you're gonna have some major breaking changes. But what we really talk about is as you're thinking about your design system, customize this versioning to meet the needs of your project. We worked with clients who, um, who do a new release every two weeks because they're pushing to production every two weeks. So they bump that major release to match their production cycle. We've worked with other clients who, um, you know, again, it'll, the design system is gonna be completely independent of their versioning process, right? But you need to come up with a way that developers can look at this and, and understand with their versioning, like, if I'm gonna bump it a patch release, I know that I'm not gonna break anything. But if I'm bumping a major release, hey, this is probably gonna be a lot of work. That was actually a point in the uh, open source, fostering open source culture talk, um, where Kevin really talked about taking that burden off of your developers to understand like, hey, I'm just upgrading to one of these and I can kind of slot the, right, the appropriate amount of time based on what those numbers mean if you're using true semantic versioning. So again, that helps and Pattern Pack's gonna make it super easy to bump that. So if I go and I create a new component and I wanna release that to my application, it's two commands to go and do that. Um, you do grunt pattern pack release, it'll do some cool stuff in your terminal and then you just do a command git push follow tags, which again, that's just your typical git push command, and that just happens to push some tags up. So I know when I first saw this, because then John did the initial prototype of um, this portion, I felt like this, I was like like wow, this is crazy, what's going on here? How does this black magic work? So here's kind of what Pattern Pack does behind the scenes for you. Um, it builds your static site, right, all that documentation, it also builds all the dependencies, so your CSS, everything else. 
it increments the version inside of your package.json or your bower.json file automatically. So depending on which type of release that I do, I can do a pattern pack release patch, release minor, release major. It'll just automatically bump that number. It'll create a new commit um, locally that is really nice because at this point I can go and like review my changes before I'm pushing out that new release to make sure all my intended changes are in there. This might be a great step where you can take a step back and go write some documentation or keep, a, keep your change log up to date um, to see what's going on. And then finally, it tags that new commit, like uses a git tag to, to reflect that. So I can do all this locally, and then once I push it up, then in my repository I have that version available. That's part of the magic of NPM and Bower. When you talk about versions, all it's doing is really pointing at a tag inside of your, um, inside of a git repository. So then finally, how do you integrate it into your application? Um, we have built-in support for NPM and Bower. Um, and really, it should be as simple as NPM install my pattern library. Um, but again, anybody who's used NPM knows that this would mean that my awesome pattern library is a public, um, a public facing pattern library or public NPM module. So that doesn't always work. The fact is we work with, actually all of the clients that we work with need to keep it private. So one option is to um, publish a private NPM package, but the workaround that we often, that we often use is NP you can do an NPM install and point to a Git repository on GitHub, Bitbucket, anywhere else. Um, a little, little hack that we use, if you look at the anatomy of a package.json dependency, is that I have my dependency, but then I can actually point using a username and password um, at my library. So um, this might be like the username and password for the Bitbucket user, or um, pretend that I don't say this, but a workaround that we have used is that we'll go and create a read-only user um, for that Git repo, and basically embed those credentials in here. Now I, knew, I know most people here embed credentials and they cringe, but again, we're creating a read-only user that you know, theoretically if that account got compromised, really somebody would only have access to see your CSS and your documentation. So it's not the end of the world. But again, pretend that I didn't say that. I hope we can delete that from the video. Um, from there, uh, you can just, you pass in a path to your Git repository that you're specifically referencing. And then the important part is that you can point at this version commit um, in there. And what's great about this, you can actually point at a version, like basically the tag that's in your repository, but a lot of people don't know you can point at, uh, at a feature branch, you can really point to any branch, you can point to a specific commit, or um, really I think those are the three. And so what's great is you can pass anything in there, right? If you're in your pattern library, you're out over here testing out some features. Um, if you commit those to a branch, you could just point to your branch right here to test those features in your main app. And we've actually built in um, some cool testing features as well in the pattern pack that I won't dive into as much. So from there, once you've done that NPM install in the app that's gonna be consuming it, um, it really just ends up showing up in your node modules folder, your Bower components. Um, and so then you just point them straight to the CSS and then becomes as simple as passing in your link href to your patterns.css file. Um, or again, if you wanna mess with this in your build system and move around the CSS file, it doesn't have to stay in your node modules. Um, yeah, and actually I will point that out because we have a couple minutes left. So the one feature that, uh, you know, we put together our first, very first alpha version, rolled it out on a project that we were working on, and within five minutes, anybody who's kind of followed this, um, developers were like, oh my gosh, this is the most annoying thing ever because now to test any CSS changes, I'm having to go like do a release over here in this repository, do an NPM install in my main project and it didn't work. So Pattern Pack actually supports uh, an integration task that you define a folder on your computer to copy your distribution to. And so you can leave your pattern library running and rebuilding and it'll auto copy into your project and you can test changes locally without doing any extra commits or anything else. So it actually, you know, with the exception of it being a second or two longer to actually copy the file over, can actually be as seamless as just having CSS embedded in your project. So again, um, first two thirds of this talk were really focused on process and hopefully anybody here can take that away. The last third is pattern pack. Um, again, these are just ideas. I actually talked to somebody here that was almost doing exactly what pattern pack does already. Um, and we're just trying to provide you some tools to speed that up and make it easier. If you wanna check out Pattern Pack, it's available at patternpack.org. Um, we've got some great guides out there, you know, yeoman generators and all this other stuff. Um, and yeah, so that's Pattern Pack. And so just to recap kind of um, 
what we're doing here, you know, a, so much of this pattern library process is about rethinking your design process from the ground up. So again, we need to get into those cycles where you're doing discovery, design, development, and testing all together and doing that. So how do we fight zombie interfaces? How do we fight zombie pattern libraries? We focus on modularizing, you know, getting our code to, to keep those concerns together. Um, we document what's going in there. Spend more time writing, not for the sake of documenting, but for the sake of thinking through your changes. Share that code so that it can live in one centralized repository and you can make changes once and have those propagate. And yeah, that's it. So thank you. Um, I have got the slides at this link right here. Again, Pattern Pack is at patternpack.org. And uh, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, so if anybody has any, happy to take those.